So in this section, we'll be covering research data planning. This is a very important topic for any clinical and translational research study that you're considering. Specifically, we'll cover basic concepts behind the planning and collection of research data. We'll talk about the importance of thinking things through in a real-world practice before starting the collection of data. And, and finally, we'll talk about the importance of good record keeping and documentation of records for ongoing and shared research. The way we'll structure this section is we'll talk through a number of important concepts and best practices that we've picked up over the years supporting and, and investing in many, many research teams. These are very uh, common things that, that we see uh, and, and uh, by, by conveying and teaching them uh, in, in our own local environment, we've found that we could increase the, the capacity as well as the value of the research done here. So we'll run through a number of examples as we go. First example that I always give is the importance of, of uh, good data planning up front, taking a lot of time up front to make sure that you are collecting, that you're planning appropriately, so, so that at the end of the study you get good results out. Uh, we have a phrase, garbage in equals garbage out, and I've seen this play out many times in research teams that are eager to get started. They want to, um, they want to move ahead because they've got a great idea. They want to move ahead with the study very quickly. And in many cases, they'll forget important things because they didn't uh, plan up front, that they didn't take the time required up front to make sure they weren't missing anything. A lot of times, this really doesn't become evident until late in the study when you're analyzing the data. And so, so I always stress, you know, even when you think you've got it right, run it through another iteration and, and make sure that everybody on the team thinks it's right before you move forward. This really becomes an ethics issue. Uh, no matter what type of study you're doing, you're always uh, spending resources, you're always uh, put, putting individuals at some inconvenience or, or even risk by doing uh, clinical and, and translational type studies. And so if you don't get the, uh, the, the details right from the front end and you compromise the uh, ability to leverage the data that you've collected and you're not able to publish in, in, or make definitive statements on that data at the end of the trial or study as you would if you had done it right, then you've really done the people that you're working with, the, the, the individuals that are contributing to your study as volunteers, you've done them a great disservice because you haven't gotten the uh, scientific benefit that goes along with the risk or the inconvenience that they put into the uh, study. So I stress it's, it's an ethics thing as well as a data and uh, study reliability thing. So one of the things that, that I see a lot here is we'll, we'll have a, someone that has a great idea. We will um, meet with that individual and, and sort of start fleshing out that idea. And a lot of times they, they haven't really thought things through. What, the, what they really had an idea on is, hey, let's just start collecting a lot of data. And this maybe might come down from a department chair or maybe uh, you know, well-meaning individual that, that's really kind of getting, uh, get, 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 getting their interest peaked around data and being able to sort of collect and, and, and manage large data sets and sort of the promise that if we do this, then great things are going to happen. A lot of times if you don't put the time up front to really sort of uh, dial things down and think very hard about a primary hypothesis for what you're doing, maybe a secondary outcome measurements, but, but instead you just try to do everything at once, uh, bad things happen. You know, a good, good way that this happens in practice, uh, I, I think, is I'll, I'll meet with research teams from time to time and, and rather than an individual research team, I'm, I'm meeting with a department. And, and the department chair will say, hey, I've got this great idea, and what we want to do is we want to uh, create this great big registry. And, and I'll meet with the group and say, well, you know, what, what, are, what are you going to do with that registry? And, and sort of the, the, the answer to that is very short, and it's just, well, you know, if we had, if we had a registry and we were able to collect data for, from, from all of our individuals that are seeing patients, and, and the patients might be enter, entering data themselves through surveys, you know, we could just do everything. And, I'd, and I'll usually say, well, you know, that's, that's great, uh, but, but uh, you know, who, who is going to be entering the data? Well, well everyone is going to be entering the data, and, and, well, you know, and, and we'll get it from all of, the, all of the systems around campus as well. 
And, and then I'll ask, well, you know, what are you going to do with that data? What kind of reporting are you going to do with that data? And, and, you know, the answer will be, you know, everything. You know, we, we, you know, if we had this, we could do recruitment, we could do uh, quality improvement studies, all, all sorts of things are possible here. And, and, and usually what I try to do next is say, well, you know, let's, let's think about that. Because w w one thing that we've learned over time is that by caring about everything, you really care about nothing when it, when it comes to data because there's no way you're going to be able to invest all of the resources it's going to take to have really solid, good quality data uh, unless you really, really think it through, unless you quantify uh, so, sort of the benefits and the return on investment on these things so, so that you're really getting good quality uh, oversight of the data. So rather than thinking in, in terms of everything, why don't we think about in terms of, you know, what would be the thing that we could do in two months that would really change the world here. And if we could, if we could come up with something small and sort of build up and around that, that, then we've got something to build from. Or in the case where we're doing a clinical study or trial, I, I would typically say, hey, this is, uh, this is bad policy. We really don't want to go fishing when we're doing a clinical study or trial. We really need to sort of rein things in, and you really need to think about that primary hypothesis. You need to be able to think about what figure one in the study is going to look like when you publish it or, or table one and you need to think think very carefully about uh, collecting data around one or two things that you're going to be testing definitively rather than coming at it with sort of a full-fledged we'll just collect everything and decide later so so it sounds simple but but in practice it's really hard to, to uh, practice self-control and go through the process making sure that you're uh, collecting the, the primary data that you need for your clinical study or trial so, uh, so sort of going the other way, I've seen a lot of studies that, that have come to me that, that uh, basically say, you know, this is a really simple study. All we need to do is collect a few things, then we run the analysis, and then we publish in the New England Journal of Medicine, et cetera. Uh, I remember specifically a study team coming to me a, a number of years ago. And, and they use that phrase, you know, Paul, this is a really simple study. We're going to have people come in for two visits, and, and we're really just going to do two things. So we're going to do a blood draw, and we're going to do from that a metabolic panel, and we're going to shoot an MRI image. And, and, and from that, we're, we're, going to, we're going to do the study over two visits. Maybe it was a randomization of, you know, you know uh, a little bit of randomization with the patients, et cetera. But, but from the, the standpoint of the data, it was very, very simple two visits, we're going to be measuring a couple of things, and, and then we're done. So, so I started asking questions at that point and said, well, you know, I, I understand a little bit about imaging, so, you know, I also understand enough about it that I know that you can't just sort of feed an MRI image into a statistics package. So, so maybe let's think about it a little bit what, what you're planning on doing there. Is it the tumor size? Is it, is it a diameter? Is it a volume type, type measurement? You know, think about those things that are going to be coming out of that high density image data that you're going to be using for your quantitative analysis. And, and from that, you know, maybe, maybe we came up with five or six measurements that, uh, that were going to be important at each of those uh, imaging uh, events. And then we started talking about metabolic panel. You know, that's not just one thing. That's really a number of things. You know, that might be the cholesterol or the glucose level. And so we started thinking about that and particularly putting things in, in terms of units. It, it really helped the study team start thinking very discreetly oh yeah, yeah, I guess we do need a field for glucose. I, I guess we do need one for, uh, for, for uh, 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 blood pressure. Oh, and, and while we're collecting blood pressure, maybe we could split that up into systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So, so I'd say by the time that uh, study team left my office that day, we probably had them up to about 60 measurements that they were going to be collecting. So the things that I just mentioned, as well as things like, you know, do you really need to know, you know, some sort of an identifier for the patient, or do you need to know a name, an address, phone number, maybe gender, ethnicity, those things that might, uh, might really play a factor in helping you analyze this data later on. So they left with about 60 measurements that they were going to be collecting rather than two. But, but I also left them with this exercise, and I said, well, you know, go home and think about your primary, secondary hypotheses. Uh, let, let's, let's look at those outcome measurements. Think about how you're going to analyze that, and, and then come back to me and come back with, with an even richer set of, of information and data that you're going to be collecting. And, and I stressed, as I always do, the, uh, the, the thinking about this in terms of what exactly would be stored in a 
you know, in an Excel type field or a data table type field, and what units would belong to that particular measurement. And if, you, if, if they do that, what I've found is, you know, it really, it really is hard to start thinking about MRI images in one of those Excel spreadsheet uh, type cells. And so I say, well, go, go do this exercise and really sort of think about these things in a discrete way and then get back to me. By the time we launched that study, I think we had about 400 variables that we were collecting on, on every patient. And so it you know, started with two and ended with 400. And, and I would say that you know, that's, that's pretty common when you start thinking things are, are simple. A lot of times they become more complex later on, and that's good because we really want to make sure that we are uh, collecting the right things that we're going to analyze later. So another thing I always try to stress in, in when individual teams are looking at uh, putting a data collection strategy together <clears throat> is in, addi in addition to uh, thinking about each measurement, think about the right type of measurement uh, for, for, for each of those concepts. And so, uh, you know, in, in uh, basic statistics classes, individuals uh, learn about the, the differences between nominal ordinal and, and continuous variables, uh, nominal being things like sex and race, where there's no ordering effect, ordinal maybe where there's some, some uh, uh, clustering or cate cate categorization uh, of data that has an ordering effect, but, but it's not uh, uh, t tiny and discrete like a continuous measurement, maybe like a blood pressure, which, which would have uh, you know, one increment for every millimeter of mercury. So, so I always stress uh, that, you know, again, while we're thinking about uh, the collection of this, let's think about the analysis phase and let's make sure that we're choosing the right type of variable for each of the, each of the different entities that we're collecting. Uh, as well, I always uh, stress that unless there's some really good reason on the front end, uh, don't ever collapse data before you need to. So continuous variables, you know, if you've got a temperature measurement, uh, uh, you can always calculate later whether they had a fever by some, some rule, but you can't ever go the other way. Just by knowing yes, no, and fever, we can't go backwards and say, let's calculate the continuous variable. So, you know, don't, don't collapse variables before they, uh, before they need to be collapsed. The other thing that comes out a lot in the discussion around measurement types is what do I do with that high density data? Things like an ECG waveform or, or an MRI or a CT or an X-ray scan. And again, we talked about that in the last, uh, last slide. Uh, really, I, I always stress that, uh, you know, keep the high density data intact. You know, you don't want to throw away the MRI image. You don't want to throw away the ECG waveform. But typically, when you get ready to analyze those data, uh, let's, let's choose the ECG as, as an example in this, in this case. You know, typically, you're, you're not going to be analyzing, you know, the whole ECG and comparing that against uh, everyone else's ECG. What you're probably going to be doing is looking for the average heart rate or maybe the, the longest QT interval during this segment of, of an exercise profile, et cetera. So, so I always recommend that we keep the high density data, keep it on file, but, but in terms of the, the structured data that we're going to be collecting for the study and analyzing later, think about the post-process values, that, that long QT interval, the, the uh, tumor diameter as measured on that MRI. Uh, 